Okay, so um, first of all, thanks for doing this interview. You're welcome. Um, and a couple of words first. First, um, at any point, if there's something too sensitive, just let me know that I should cut it. Okay. Um, and I usually once I do the interview, I go home and boost the sound, and then I upload mm. it to YouTube uh, straight away. Okay. Yeah. Mm, but you know, if you want to see the thing first before I upload it, let me know as well. Okay. All right. Yep. Um, so let's start with uh, your name. Um, I'm Ben. I'm <coughs> I'm involved with the local hackerspace in Leipzig, the subclub, and uh, I'm also a student, an MA student, Master of Science student at the Chair of Digital Humanities at the University here. Mm. Okay. And I'm particularly interested in, in your work with uh, Arabic manuscripts. Uh, could, could you tell me more about that? <laughs> um, so, those, there aren't actually manuscripts, they are printed works. Um, and uh, um, I am currently in the preparatory steps of uh, making uh, of digitizing these uh, printed uh, classical Arabic works. Um, as there isn't a, as there currently isn't a viable solution to uh, to recognize these texts uh, with a high accuracy, I hope over the next few years to uh, change that. Uh, substantially um, using a method that uh, has already been very successful with uh, um, other scripts like uh, Creek and Hebrew. Mm. And how, is, how are you doing that? How are you, what kind of tools are you using? Um, so the method itself, it's, uh, it's based on a neural network approach. <clears throat> um, it's been around for quite a while. The first publication uh, on the neural network architecture itself is, is from the late 90s and has become quite popular uh, over time. It's a so-called long short-term memory network um, that is basically able to retain uh, um, retain signals uh, over large time frames and uh, the actual loss functions that defines the goal that you train the uh, network towards uh, is from 2009 and uh, uh, makes it and that's the crucial part that makes it possible to actually train these networks uh, um, successfully. Mm -hmm. um, currently, it's the software is a highly uh, is highly specialized, so it's not it's not based on an on a established framework, but uh, it's written in Python and it only implements this one network architecture and this one uh, loss function. But uh, hopefully we will be able to um, port it to a more widely used framework in the future so that we can also um, um, Pull advances from these network, from these uh, archi uh, from these frameworks uh, into our work. In this LSTM network, you're saying it's not based on any uh, framework. Is it something that's built from scratch? Yeah, it's it's a um, um, <coughs> it's a custom implementation of the network. Uh, somebody wrote it at the university uh, or the. Uh, Institute of Technology in Kaiserslautern, I think, and um, it's open source and we're currently still using it, but it has some drawbacks uh, that make it uh, hard to use. So it's, it's not possible to run it on GPUs, it's not possible to, um, to um, parallelize it, it's not possible. Um, 
it's kind of slow to train and uh, yeah for these reasons it would be advantageous to port it to a more general framework mm -hmm. still based on in python but uh, um, it would compile it to, uh, to another format uh, that can for example run on, run on gpus okay um why python um so the the um so there are two large um or two established um open source softwares for optical uh, character recognition one is called tesseract it's uh it's a clutch that has been used for 30 years and uh, uh, methodologically it's not um, um, it's not state of the art so it uses a really it uses a quite simple um, a quite simple um, algorithm it just has been tweaked over the last 30 years so that it can still somewhat compete with newer approaches but uh, um, currently it's uh, but the approach it breaks completely down on uh, on certain kinds for scripts, uh, for example Arabic, um, because it's not always possible to cleanly separate characters, uh, and uh, this engine needs to do that. And the other one is Octopus, which uses these this neural network, and it's written in Python. And uh, I started forking this software package uh, and uh, rewriting parts of it to make it more easy to use, to uh, make it more secure. Uh, and so we want to keep Python just because of inertia. And uh, then, of course, Python is also quite uh, popular in the machine learning community. and. Uh, I believe the majority of the, especially of the neural networking uh, work, um, happens in Python. Mm -hmm. There's also, of course, um, R, and uh, I think some people are using Java, but uh, at least the R people don't do as much with neural networks as Python people. Yeah. How, how many people are, are working on your team? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I'm currently the only computer scientist. Um, I so there are currently two people doing the general OCR work, and um, um, for the Arabic, there's also. So there's a postdoc for the Arabic work, and he has some other computer scientists doing stuff that's distantly related, um, but has nothing to do with OCR. And um, there are also people um, in uh, in London, uh, for example, who are keenly interested in this work and. Uh, they, for example, they would certainly contribute resources um, um, in the future, for, um, especially towards uh, ground truthing data, because uh, we currently we don't have ground truthed data uh, for these classical Arabic works, um, just because there wasn't a system around uh, for transcribing these efficiently. Um, that changed in the in the last few months. Been, you know, I wrote a simple system that's somewhat usable, and um, for example, they would <coughs> um, they would uh, contribute some uh, some student assistants who would just transcribe these texts, uh, so we can then use this transcribed quantum data to train the network or multiple networks. 
um, but from the computer science side, I'm <laughs> currently the only one working on this. Yeah. Okay. And what kind of, what kind of data are you training uh, <laughs> your neural network on? Um, the so the training process it, it uses um, it's a sequence to sequence mapping. So um, the training process. Um, Gets um, gets uh, line images uh, as input, and so it's a recurrent network, and it's fed uh, one slice of a line at a, in a time step, and it produces um, um, an output matrix that contains as many uh, um, as many slices as input slices, and then this output matrix. Uh, um, there are areas uh, of uh, connected outputs of the softmax layer that contain these um, that contain the classes of the associated um, characters in the image. So um, all that is needed is um, a line image and a transcription for this line. So, so it's not necessary to uh, to pinpoint uh, exact uh, character locations, it's sufficient to just take a line and write, uh, transcribe it completely, and that's only that's needed for the network to uh, to learn the task of recognizing text. That's especially important because in the past um, was quite complex to. Uh, to uh, create new classifiers for OCR um, work. Uh, for example, Tesseract um, requires um, lots of manual labor, um, cutting out single characters, um, creating masks, uh, etc. And uh, that's not, so not something that's um, accessible to many uh, humanities people. Um, while transcribing lines or transcribing texts is something they are usually trained to do anyway, and uh, they know what to uh, what to look out for while while this uh, um, they know how to to achieve uh, consistency and. Uh, um, that isn't necessarily the case with other methods. Mm. Um, so, what is this process of uh, transcribing text? Are, are the humanities scholars the one who do the transcription? Mm. Um, could you tell me a bit more about that process? I'm not familiar with that part. Uh, I'm not terribly familiar with it myself. So, <coughs> the software is basically just shows you a uh, page image and uh, uh, with highlighted lines and on the other half of the page uh, there are just empty text boxes and they write what they see on the page into a text box and so you get this transcription for a singular text line. Uh, it's somewhat more granular than people are used to, I think. Um, so, um, but it's uh, yeah, it's, it's still a common process. So, uh, so people who work with um, physical objects, of course, have to transcribe them quite often. So, um, so. Um, Egyptologists are uh, used to transcribing uh, hieroglyphs into some other format. Um, um, people working with cuneiform are also used to transcribing stuff. Uh, so um, it's quite a common process. And uh, yeah, mm. I don't know. It's it, it's basically just assigning. Uh, uh, it's just assigning a consistent. Sign sequence to to 
image and uh, as long as it's uh, as it fulfills the uh, criteria or requirements of the humanities people i can certainly work with that and uh, if they tell me that some that something is irrelevant uh, isn't new isn't necessary to be recognized uh, i don't care the neural network certainly doesn't care uh, they just don't have to, they just have to take care not to transcribe this feature mm. and that's the case for example with classical arabic um, uh, in arabic there's uh, something called vocalization basically um, so, so the Arabic script doesn't contain uh, vocals and so it can be sometimes quite hard to um, to uh, recognize the two words so there are hints that uh, are put above the characters to um, uh, for the reader to um, know how to vocalize this word and um, the Arabists tell me <laughs> that <laughs> so I can't really verify it because I don't read Arabic I don't, also don't read Greek or any of the other languages I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm training stuff on um, that uh, these vocalizations they are completely unnecessary they don't have any semantics um, meaning they they could be dropped completely and nothing would change for the text so uh, the neural network doesn't care I don't care they just they just shouldn't transcribe vocalization and especially uh, they shouldn't transcribe vocalization inconsistently so uh, uh, yeah hmm. they shouldn't <laughs> do that <laughs> and uh, but that's something that they actually take care before do, before doing any work, um, as far as I know. Um, so it's it's uh, quite common to have a to have a one up period of uh, people of training people to produce uh, consistent work, uh, not just for transcription, but for example for um, uh, for annotating other texts and uh, yeah most other work that digital humanists do or humans uh, uh, humanities people in general do mm. oh, yeah so i believe they already got some experience in that okay and i, I try to well not read but scheme through some papers on mm. uh, you know putting through uh, putting arabic text through ocr Mm -hmm. And um, I guess in, in some of these old manuscripts, they have a very interesting layout where you have the, I guess the main body of the text is horizontal, but then yeah. around the text, yeah. you have the vertical. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah. So, yeah, Arabic and Persian, that's certainly a challenge um, of um, page layout. There's also um, there's also a very, well, not very common, it's, uh, it's semi-common, um, especially manuscripts of uh, slanted lines. So they are writ so the lines themselves are horizontal, but each word on the line is slanted in a 45 degree angle. And uh, there's a point. Each character is slanted 45 degrees. No, the, 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 uh, the uh, word is slanted and the next word is slanted and so it's right. yeah, like books on a bookshelf. That's a, okay. I'm just not upright. And um, yeah, that's certainly a challenge, mm -hmm. but uh, right now the focus is more on um, getting the recognition at work at all. Um, because right now it doesn't work particularly well and um, it's the focus is also on um, printed 
um, critical editions. And those are usually typeset uh, very simply. So it's just a line, there's, there are, um, yeah, there are, it's not, it's not even parallel text, uh, there are no uh, notes, uh, um, there are no columns, it's just a simple line on the page. And um, so that's not an issue for page segmentation. Pa um, page segmentation is something that needs work. Um, um, we've seen it in uh, with Greek text, we've seen it with, um, with a newspaper text that um, by now the majority of, um, of mistakes um, of, an, of a whole OCR system is actually page segmentation. So uh, uh, they don't split up columns correctly, they mix up reading order, and uh, for, for a human it's usually not that hard to, um, to uh, reassemble the text correctly, but um, Especially when aided with, um, with a parallel view of the original page image. Uh, but for machine readable text or machine actionable text, uh, that's of course a different uh, case. And, but for the uh, kind of texts in Arabic we aim to work at, it's simply not, we are not there yet. Um, Hopefully we can work on. Hopefully we are fast enough to solve the first problem, so we can work on the uh, on the page segmentation issue. But uh, yeah, we will have to see. Mm. Yeah, and what's the accuracy rate right now? So um, stuff that's available on real on real um, data. Um, so, for example, Tesseract has an Arabic classifier which has an accuracy between 70-75%. Um, and that's unusable for most. I would say it's unusable for any kind of work. It's even for a, for just doing natural language processing stuff where you don't even want to read the actual text at some reason. Um, I trained um, a neural network uh, in December last year that um, on artificial training data, so basically I took some classical Arabic text uh, used a font uh, that um, looks similar or fairly similar to classical Arabic um, and to the fonts used in these classical Arabic editions and just ran it through a typesetting program and trained a neural network on that and I got I was slightly less than 1% error, or slightly above 1% error, so 99, 98.5, 99 99.5, something like that, so accuracy. And of course, that's on undegraded um, artificial data, and it was just to check that the method is um, in practice capable of. Uh, of recognizing Arabic at all. Um, the, uh, in theory, the algorithm should be able to do that, but uh, a lot of a lot of stuff in uh, in machine learning is only theoretically possible, but in practice, uh, yeah, it won't work. But at least that worked, and um, now we just need uh, true ground truth data to. Um, Train a network, and uh, then can, we can see if it will work. <laughs> I assume so. There's no reason why it shouldn't. Uh, uh, of course, there are always unknown transforms. Um, yeah. 
and this accuracy rate is actually quite in line with what we've seen for Greek, um, for polytonic Greek and Hebrew and other languages, uh, also classical Latin. It's, and there isn't there isn't a reason why it should be worse. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Tell, tell me about the uh, scholarly community. Is there a lot of people working on Arabic script compared to other languages? Um, I don't know firsthand, <laughs> actually. Uh, I only know what the humanities people tell me. Um, I believe there are a lot of people. Um, it's just that the um, that the corpus of Arabic literature is vast, vastly larger than the one in, for example, for in classical Greek or classical Latin. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, ten times larger than, than Greek and Latin combined, and most of it is. Uh, most of it has been preserved. Um, there is, well, in contrast to Greek and Latin, nobody knows exactly what is out there. So there isn't, for Greek, it's certainly there's a, while there may not be a single catalog, you can be fa fairly sure that if you combine two or three catalogs, you get the vast majority of, uh, of all works in polytonic Greek. Uh, if I understand it correctly, that's not the case for Arabic. And um, most universities have an, have an uh, Arabic department. Uh, of course, there are also a lot of universities in the Arabic world where it's well, there are departments, pe people working there. Um, I believe the uh, um, it's not as accessible as uh, as other work because um, the uh, language uh, of work is is either Arabic itself. Of French, so uh, at least for me as a computer scientist, I I can't just uh, I don't speak French, so I can't just uh, I can't just uh, order fifty books and get uh, at least an overview of the field. So it's just not possible. Um, while for while for most other stuff, or polytonic Greek uh, or Greek thought or Latin, uh, whatever, it's usually possible to find at least some introductory works in English, and that's not the case for Arabic. Um, yeah, but I believe the community to be quite large. Um, it's not, it's probably not as large as the, as the classical Greek community, but uh, there are people working on it and the, the corpus is vastly larger. Um, there are there's the whole Arabic world. If you universities abound where people are working on it, uh, it's maybe not as prominent as Greek and classics, especially from a Western perspective. Um, but uh, yeah. I. Just assume there are people working on it. What what drew you to this work? Uh, I like doing it. <laughs> they pay me uh, badly, but they pay me. Um, so it's. Um, so, um, 
Uh, as digital in humanities is still a quite new field. It's it's uh, easy to make large improvements. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's uh, we are currently more or less in the state uh, where we just have all these wonderful tools and nobody uh, has ever tried it on this data and we're just trying stuff out and uh, I at least think that to be quite exciting <laughs> um, and uh, to be honest yeah major alternative doing machine learning right now is uh, advertising so well, most of the other stuff that's uh, most of the other departments doing uh, doing machine learning most of the uh, uh, most of private enterprises doing machine learning in the end they are all advertising agencies like Google and uh, yeah, it's it's not something that uh, is of a comparable societal benefit and uh, yeah. No, as, as a deep enthusiast of the humanities myself, I, I have to thank you for doing this. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, if you don't mind, could, let's move the subject to um, Sublet. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how long have you been um, here in Sublet? 2009, 2010, something like that. That was when it started, right? 2009? No, it was already here when I came to Leipzig. So. Okay. So you're not originally from Leipzig? Uh, I lived in the US for a year and then came back and yeah, just after the boss. So, right, right, right. Yeah. so you, you lived in Leipzig before and then yeah. you in the US yeah. and you came back? Okay, right. And uh, since, since then till now in 2016, has subnet changed? I hope so. <laughs> uh, it's uh, um, I believe the community has changed somewhat. Um, some realism has set in. <laughs> um, I hope that um, uh, that the outside image has gotten better. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, the, the rooms themselves, they were in quite a bad shape when we uh, initially moved in here. And uh, so they changed a lot. There's no power everywhere. We've got uh, um, running water. <laughs> uh, we got a kitchen, all this kind of stuff that makes the room more livable and we've got internet we, we've lived here for more than a year without any internet and or just crappy internet that always broke down and uh, yeah so of yeah. course the, in the beginning yeah mm. um, of course it changed in that regard and <laughs> yeah, it would have probably died if it didn't but, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, some realism is set in and that uh, the image has gotten better. What do you mean by those yes. two things? Um, I believe in the beginning people were thinking the sublet is going to be like this other large and uh, don't want to say famous hacker spaces, but uh, hacker spaces uh, where people are competing for time slots to do stuff and everybody is doing awesome projects all the time. And uh, uh, by now, we've, we are doing 
stuff that's not directly related to uh, to something that these kinds of hacker spaces do. And uh, I think it's somewhat related to um, to the fact that it's quite easy to find space to do stuff in Leipzig, and so people there isn't there is much pressure. Um, uh, to do projects uh, in an already established space. Um, and uh, in the beginning, we had active discussions uh, when somebody asked to do an event here or to do a project uh, here, um, if they should be allowed to do it. But by now, those have basically subsided. And, uh, yeah. Um, as long as it's remotely related to technology or culture or open anything, um, people can do it. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, of course, it weakens the profile of the hackerspace somewhat, but then uh, it's. Uh, it's probably uh, quite good for this socialization of the common nerds that uh, they come into contact with uh, non-nerds in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, of course with this this with these discussions and uh, the, uh, this very technology-centered uh, um, view in the beginning. Uh, there were also, I think, there were behaviors that were quite hostile to outsiders, and uh, there were also people who wouldn't come back to the space just because of this. Uh, yeah these behaviors and I hope that changed by now. <laughs> At least I haven't heard uh, that many complaints, but uh, yeah. What kind of behaviors? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, hostility to non-technological, to people not as involved with technology. Uh, um, what form does this hostility <laughs> take? Let's say I come this out there and I don't know anything. Um, How would I be treated? I mostly criticism, sarcastic or cynic re uh, remarks. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Just creating an unwelcome atmosphere, um, an unwelcome um, environment for people, and uh, in the end, uh, that would only produce a, a space that's uh, that's acceptable for people who can deal with this kind of uh, this kind of uh, environment and. Uh, by now, I think the conclusion has become that uh, that's not something that the suburb was meant to be, and uh, that it should be rooted out. <laughs> and uh, this uh, this consensus hasn't always been there. Mm. So this this was publicly discussed in somewhere. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, such a such a shift is uh, takes time, and people leave, other people join, and uh, um, but yeah, it was publicly discussed, and of course, it was a so for sublab um, for the standards of the sublab, it was a semi public or semi private. Uh, discussion. It's just that there isn't uh, the sublet sublet doesn't uh, have uh, 
have the strict notion of members and non-members as other hackerspaces do. So anybody can just walk in here if the door is open and uh, there are a lot of non-members uh, doing events and uh, there are lots of members uh, who haven't been in Leipzig for a long time. So it's, uh, um, there isn't that much of a... Um, yeah of a difference between members and non-members uh, and uh, all the discussions where uh, at least if they happened in person they were usually in, in open in open forum so people could just come and, uh, of course these also involve non-members so there wouldn't be a reason to kick them out <laughs> um, yeah. And um, it, it is, are there a lot of new people joining Subnet? I honestly don't know. <laughs> um, they, there are people doing stuff. Um, there are certainly more space or more time slots to do stuff. <laughs> um, so uh, if people would want to do any uh, would want to do an event or, or a meeting of a group or start a new group, uh, that would certainly be possible. Um, but uh, as I'm by now, I'm not that often in the space anymore, so uh, I honestly don't know. Mm. There are some, there are groups meeting here that uh, are relatively new. They also do uh, regular, uh, regular events like the crypto parties and uh, and the Technik Sprechstunde, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that most of these are members also. And uh, as I said, that anybody, anybody can walk in here if the door is open and uh, if they want to do anything, they just have to find a member that uh, opens the door for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, on Saturdays, you guys have a cooking thing. Yeah. Right. And on the, on the calendar, on the website, it mm -hmm. says Phantom Power. Is Phantom Power referring to like the vegan cooking thing that yeah. you guys have here. Why is it called Phantom Power? Uh, Phantom Power? Yeah. Well, at least uh, when I translate it too. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, English. Um, it's a bad pun. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Phantomspeisung is the, is the German word and it can either mean Phantom Power, like uh, feeding a microphone through the signal uh, line or uh, Speisung is also feeding in Germany so it's uh, yeah somebody came up with bad pun and okay. we just went with it how, how did it start this uh, cooking thing this communal dinner thing uh, I think we started doing, um, came up with the idea doing a, doing a ride back from a conference uh, to get new people into the space because almost free food, <laughs> a good internet connection is, uh, would be successful in hopefully getting new people in the space. Uh, some have stayed, <laughs> many didn't. Uh, when was that? I, 2012, 13, something like that. I mean, what's the success rate been? I mean, in I, retaining people? It's certainly less than 1%. So, um, yeah. So there were times when we had uh, 100, 150 people as guests every uh, every Saturday, at most the vast majority of them 
didn't stay. So they came, they ate, and half past eight, everybody was gone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, I think there are some members that or people that did stuff here in the past to just used it as a good opportunity to just eat something and then go into the workshop and solder something together or else. Um, yeah, but overall I believe it to be certainly less than one percent successful. Mm. But I think that's to be expected. It would be unrealistic to believe anything else. And the budget comes from membership fees? Oh no, uh, people people donate and usually there's more money in the, uh, uh, in the donation box than we spend for the food. And, uh, the, uh, the revenue is usually it's either used for general improvements in the sub lab or um, we build new kitchens semi regularly. And uh, so with each iteration, the kitchen grows larger and larger until it subsumes the whole sub lab. Okay. Yeah. Right. May, may I cook something and bring it this Saturday just to contribute? You can, certainly. <laughs> uh, it probably won't fit into the meal plan. <laughs> um, but, yeah, anybody can bring stuff. Mm, okay, that's cool. Uh, what was I going to say? Right, uh, in terms of... Uh, the people cooking in Sublab on Saturdays, I noticed, well, I asked I asked them, I guess, and, and all of them are not members. Yeah, um, so <laughs> I think I'm the only member. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. So you have like non-members coming in and doing something for Sublab. Yeah. Uh, and it is, is this something that grew organically and you know people just brought their friends or, or have these guys been in somewhere all this time and then when the cooking thing started they just sort of shifted to cooking? I don't remember. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so s some people One guy, he did some stuff here, and then uh, uh, I didn't. I wasn't around to organize the cooking for a month or so, and then he just took over. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and other people, they came for the food, and then uh, uh, and then had for a while. And, just stayed. Um, but it's also not that uncommon for non-members to to organize stuff. The Technik Sprechstunde, um, they had a, they share a single membership. So there's technically none of them are members or all of them are. Um, it's quite common to just have one member for a whole crew, so they can, so get, they can unlock the door and uh, meet here. But uh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, as, especially as there isn't aren't any privileges with, uh, associated with mem membership and actual membership is quite expensive, especially in a poor city like Leipzig. Uh, it's not uncommon. How much is the membership? Um, there's a discounted rate of 12 euros a uh, month and the uh, standard rate is 23 euros a month. And yeah, that's quite a lot. <laughs> What's the rent here? 
600 euros a month mm -hmm. or so for 220 square meters. Um, but that's without heating. We can't really heat the space in winter. Or well, we could heat it, but it would bankrupt us. Uh, it's without power. <laughs> so power is, I think. What are you guys doing winter then? Um, we usually heat smaller rooms. Mm -hmm. Or for the Foku. For the Phantom Speisung. Um, if you get a hundred people in here, it actually gets quite warm. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not as much of an issue. Uh, if, if you do if you do large events, you don't you don't need to you don't need to, uh, need to heat the space at all. Uh, yeah, but uh, usually we just heat smaller rooms and. Uh, you know, Subdivide large rooms, and uh, but yeah, it's of course, of course, probably heat properly heating the room would be uh, quite nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then of course there's power and there's uh, uh, all these utilities and uh, improving the space and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it takes money. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to know about Leipzig itself. What's the uh, what do you call it? Technological literacy been like here? Uh, are most people would you consider most people to be very literate technologically? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. <laughs> I couldn't make a judgment on that. Okay. And have that. I'm curious also about the, uh, let's say, the history of hacking or history of technology here in Leipzig. Have there been um, key milestones or any changes as far as you remember? So, um, yeah. Um, so um, in the past, there was a quite large community network, especially in some parts of town that didn't have uh, access to uh, broadband uh, internet. So um, there was actually a community network of several a network of several hundred nodes, and uh, ordinary people were using it, and. Um, but then now that's that's uh, yeah it's slowed down. People went maintaining their routers. They were just using it as a cheap internet access method. And um, yeah, there isn't. And uh, as I said earlier, we went. When we started the space, there was quite a bit of idealism that we were going to uh, have this large community of hackers, but uh, this, uh, I don't believe the critical mass is, is there in Leipzig. It's just not, not enough people. Um, but even now, there's not much critical mass. Hmm? Even now, there's no critical mass. Uh, there are, pe there are, of course, people um, doing stuff. Uh, um, it's more spread out than most hacker spaces. Many hacker spaces they do hardcore technology stuff, so there are only people soloing their. Uh, it would be unimaginable to have this open kitchen once a week, for example, um, in a lot of spaces. It so, um, uh, would be unimaginable that we ferment lots of special foodstuffs uh, here also. Um, and uh, so it's uh, 
yeah, there isn't this critical mass of this uh, of this stereotypical hacker image type people. Um, there are lots of people doing stuff that could be considered hacking, like food hacking and people doing open culture stuff or uh, building community networks or whatever. Um, but uh, as it more sp as it is more spread out, uh, it's not as self perpetuating as uh, as a more narrow uh, group of people. Would be. Mm. At least I believe so. Mm. And would you say that? Leipzig is well placed to be uh, to become a smart city. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, it's uh, of course. There's always this issue. Uh, the issue of money. There's this issue with. Uh, uh, with uh, gentrification associated with this, with uh, these um, uh, government driven uh, quality of life improvements. <laughs> so, uh, of course, the basic idea behind this is to increase income, to produce more taxes, to increase the quality of life. And that's uh, um, I don't think the money is there. I, most of the actors that, uh, that do stuff that would be considered part of this smart city, so like me as a hacker space on this uh, community work open workshops, um, people doing community people building community networks, all all those are actively hostile to this uh, uh, to the gentrification process <laughs> of course they are because uh, they would be Certainly, they would certainly be victims of this process, and um, yeah, as there aren't the resources to work against these people, uh, I don't think that Leipzig is going to be a smart city anytime soon. Mm -hmm. At least not as envisioned in uh, by government actors. What, what do you think is likely to happen? Uh, I believe it will slowly fail. Um, in, the, in the past, there was uh, also a, um, a large, large initiative to um, for open data in Leipzig and. Uh, there was a lot of a uh, lot of press about it, and quite a pe quite a few people were enthusiastic. Um, but um, when the city government realized they are not going to see an an increase in taxes anytime soon. They didn't have the money to invest in startups or anything like that. Lots of the people who were interested on the technological side weren't interested in, do, in making money out of it. Um, yeah, it just slowly died because uh, the energy dis dissipated. Um, the city didn't have the resources to, to enforce, uh, to ex uh, or to actively subsidize uh, subsidize any organization to to push this uh, open data uh, initiative and I believe it's probably going to 
um, to be the same with the smart city. When was that the Open Data Initiative? 2014 or so. Um, there was also the university involved and uh, and the um, the city was also they claim to be interested in, in, in funding a hackerspace type thing but over time it, uh, uh, it became clear that they just wanted an incubator for startups and uh, they didn't actually want to pay for it because they couldn't pay for it and uh, so yeah um, Even even if they wanted to, they could push this kind of change, and uh, and yeah, especially uh, with collaboration of uh, with uh, without collaboration of people already doing these kinds uh, organizing these kinds of uh, spaces and processes. Okay, um, okay, a couple more questions. Uh, one is. Um, I guess there, there was a time, uh, no, I can't remember, but there was a time when the finance minister, Shogo, is that his name? Mm. Uh, he, he, he was very concerned with hacking and cybersecurity and all that. And he had oh, yeah, he, he was the interior minister. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, did, in the past. did that affect anything in the hacking scene across Germany? <sighs> Some laws were changed, and they are still in a. So, in theory, the legal um, the legal basis for doing hacking type work is uh, is a large gray area, but. Uh, um, as uh, hacking tools are illegal and it's nowhere defined what a hacking tool is. When it becomes a hacking tool, uh, all this kind of stuff. So, um, so in theory, the, the legal situation is quite, uh, is quite complicated. But uh, um, I'm not aware that anybody has been charged with the possession of hacking tools or um, um, yeah I don't I don't think the, the uh, much has changed for the hacking community in general because um, historically there's a there's quite a large aversion for doing government work in the German hacking community, so it's, uh, there's not this cozy relationship as in other countries between the government and the hacking community. <laughs> and uh, so um, on this, uh, on the stick side of the equation, there is a law that hasn't been applied yet on the carrot side. So, People, most people in Germany just aren't interested in, in doing government work or doing, doing government security stuff, joining the army to do cyber war kind of work. So, yeah, it's all quite separate. <laughs> mm -hmm. You mentioned this, it's not a cozy relationship. Uh, is it an antagonistic one? Um, it's not antagonistic. It's uh, the hacker communi community in, in Germany. It's uh, at least in a, in, a, in a public in a public world is, is more like a. It's quite like a civil rights organization, so it's, uh, um, it opposes 
laws that uh, that infringe on uh, on privacy uh, and uh, and um, and uh, personal freedoms in the digital world or in the real world <laughs> and um, and uh, as um, the I wouldn't call it the official or the official uh, organization of German hackers, but most people are outspoken are usually in some kind of associated with the CCC. Um, um, there are they are left wing and pacifistic, and there's uh, there's quite this. Um, yeah, there's uh, um, there's quite a slant to this uh, to this pacifistic internationalist uh, view, and it's uh, um, so yeah, it's not exactly antagonistic, but uh, it's just the wish not to be involved with, uh, with the militarization of. Uh, of a technology that shouldn't be used for nefarious purposes, especially not by government actors. Okay. Okay. Last question from me is: um, so far, I've been the one asking the questions and kind of guiding the interview along. But let's say if I handed the interview over to you, um, what kind of question would you ask about hacking, about technology and hacking in Leipzig or in Germany? I'm bad at this stuff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't do an interview in the first place. <laughs> um, no, honestly. Nothing comes to mind. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, th this is kind of a, a new thing I'm trying out because I realize I would like to hear from the people I interview. But yeah, still trying it out. Okay, so thank you so much for this interview. You're welcome. Yeah. Just turn it off. Yeah.